رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما رب العالمين to continue with the explanation of Kitab al-Riqaq, the softness of the heart, the book or the chapter of the softness of the heart from Sahih al-Bukhari. And we've reached chapter or bab number 14. Babu aw babun al-ghina ghina nafs The title is al-ghina ghina nafs Richness is the richness of the soul. That's the title. And he has taken that Rahimahullah from a hadith that will follow shortly. Waqawullah ta'ala and he adds to the title also Ayahsabuna Annama Numidduhum Bihim in Mali Wabanin Ila Kawlihi Ta'ala Minduni Dali Kahumlaha Amilun. So he adds the ayah where Allah Azza wa Jal says, This is from Al Mu'minun, Suratat Al Mu'minun, Ayahsabuna, do they think? That what we supply them and we continue to supply them of, from or of, money and children. Do they think that that continuous supply that we keep giving to them of money and children, that this is good for them, that this is good thing that is coming their way. Allah says, Bella yash'urun. No, they but they don't feel. They don't recognize the reality of what is coming their way. That is, do those who disbelieve in Allah Azza wa Jal, and yet despite that, find that they're continuously being quote-unquote blessed. So they're becoming richer and richer, and having more children, more prosperous, more successful. The things that they want in life comes their way. Allah says, do they think that this is khair coming their way? Allah says, Bella yash'urun. They do not know. They don't perceive the reality of this life and the reality of what is coming their way. So are these blessings, if someone disobeys Allah and yet they get worldly favors, are these blessings? They're not. This is what the scholars say Istidraj, you're being led on. You're being tricked in a sense. Because you think that you're being rewarded. Or your, your crimes are going unpunished. And that is a trick that you play on yourself and the shaitan plays on you and you believe it. You're being tricked. This is istidraj. That is if Allah Azza wa Jal doesn't want the good for that person anymore... He gives them from this dunya and they continue to commit heinous acts until Allah Azza wa Jal takes them and eradicates them. So don't believe that money when it comes your way is always a good sign. Or that if Allah Azza wa Jal blesses someone with a lot of children that it's always a good sign. Or if you get promoted or move into a big house or you're never sick that it's always a good sign. No, it depends on how you are as a person, whether you are pleasing to Allah or not. Is it actually uh, rahmah wa ni'mah am istidraj? Or is it istidraj? Again, being led on, led to your destruction, your own destruction. And then he says, Ila qawlihi ta'ala, he continues with, with the uh, several of the ayat. Uh, Allah Azza wa says towards the end of those, which Al-Bukhari highlights, Bal qulubuhum fi ghamratin min hadha. Says, but their hearts, despite everything, but their hearts are unaware of what is happening to them. And that is the real tragedy in life is that you live your entire life and you're yet to understand yourself and the reality of life. It's not enough for you to read the news to understand what is happening in the world. It's not enough. Because those who report it and those who analyze it don't understand life itself. Don't understand how Allah gives and takes what lasts and what doesn't. So the news reporting and the analysis that you find in the news is all inaccurate. Until someone comes who understands the sunan 
understands the Quran, understands the Sunnah, and tells you this person, even though he's successful, his success will not last. He'll be defeated. This person, although he is prosperous, that prosperity will not last because he's not pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal. And those little group of people who are oppressed, if they hold on to the rope of Allah Azza wa Jal, they will overcome their oppressors. Even if you don't see it right now or see its possibility. You with me? So that's why Allah says, بَلْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فِي غَمْرَةٍ مِنْ هَذَا Their hearts are unaware. Ghamra is as if you have taken this, the heart of yours and immersed it in a liquid and it's unaware of what is happening outside. Ghamra, ghamartahu fi shay. You put it inside. That is when you're intoxicated with the dunya. So the hadith and the single hadith under that chapter is when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَيْسَ الْغِنَى عَنْ كَثْرَةِ الْعَرَضِ وَلَكِنَّ الْغِنَى غِنَى النَّفْسِ He says rich, riches or being rich, being affluent. It's not having plentiful worldly possessions, but it's the richness of the soul. Being rich is not having a lot of money, it is the richness of the soul. And here the Prophet ﷺ redefines what it means to be rich. So if someone were to ask you, how do you define a rich person? What would you say? Typically. Yeah, sorry. A billionaire, a millionaire. He has a lot of money in the bank. A lot of investments. He, ha he can do whatever he wants. He can fly wherever he wants. Buy whatever. Invest in whatever. He has connections. That is the definition of a rich, rich person. Yet, we want you to think about the fact that this rich person, he could have or she could have all of this, but yet in reality be poor. Poor where? Here, on the inside. Have you ever encountered or knew about a rich person who's really stingy with money? Right? So if you have a lot of money, why would you be a miser if you have a lot? Like they count the dollar. Why would you do that? Because they're not rich here. They're afraid. If I give you, I'll have less. So I have, I, obviously I cannot give you. What, are you just going to leave me with less and just take my money? This is my money. I won't give you my money. Right? Even though they have a lot. Which tells you that if a person is not rich on the inside... It doesn't matter how much you give him on the outside. He'll still feel like as if they are poor. Feel like, like they have nothing. Feel like that they have to run after money and serve money and protect it. So there is faqr on the inside. And if there is faqr on the inside, you can never run away from it. Poverty on the inside, you cannot run away from it. No matter how much you have. And so that person could in fact, and some people do that, they could in fact live as a poor person or run after money like a poor person, like someone who doesn't have anything. They worry about it like they have nothing. They run after it like they have none of it. And they are ready to serve it like a person who has no money at all. Because they're empty on the inside. Flip that, a person who's Rich on the inside, but doesn't have much. And then you, get, you, you come to them and you say, can you give me, can you help me with? And they'll say, yes, here. Although they don't have a lot. And they did that. I mean, I, I saw that happening, uh, although I don't condone it, but some of those who shoot videos and they want to experiment. So they go to some homeless person. I don't know if you've seen these. Huh? And they tell him and he say, Brother, could you help me? Uh, a couple of dollars, I just need to catch the bus. A couple of dollars, I just need to buy a cup of coffee. Now this person is what? Homeless. What does he have? Nothing. He's begging for money, right? And he says, yes, brother, take it. And he gives it to them. Right? 
And then they come ask him later, why, why would you give that to me? He says, because you need it. And I understand what it means to need. So of course I'm going to help you. Whereas another person in a, is in a suit just coming out from a fancy office, you ask him for a couple of dollars, what do we say, what? We're just going to give you free money for nothing? For, for, like in return for nothing? No, I've got to get something in return for that because that's the mentality. That's poverty here. I got to get something if you want to, I, I got to get something if I'm going to give you something. That's how I live my entire life. Whereas the other person lived through and understands life better, much better. This is even without discussing religion at all. Now when you come to religion, if you have ghina nafs, then you are rich. A person may ask, well, how can I be rich on the inside? And I, as a human being, I'm constantly in need. From the time that you are born, you're crying out for your mother, for food, for shelter, for love, right? The rest of your life, you're talking about, you're worrying about your needs. I want to eat. I'm thirsty. I'm afraid. We always are lacking so we are in ourselves poor, right? The faqr that we have, the poverty that we have is intrinsic, is in us, baked in us. How can I be a rich person on the inside? How can I have ghina nafs? What makes you rich? Iman, Allah Azza wa Jal. That's it. That's if you have Allah on the inside, if you trust Him and that He is the provider, and the caretaker, and the defender, and the guide, and everything that you need, you have everything on the inside. And that is ghina nafs. And that's why you can, if you are rich on the inside, you can receive money and give money easily. You will not be devastated if you lose your job. Why? Allah is the provider, not so and so. I'll get another thing. I'm not going to go hungry, insha'Allah. Allah Azza wa will accept my dua, will open doors for me. Right? If uh, you become sick, you're not going to be devastated. Why? Allah Azza wa is the healer. And if not, there is benefit in it. Even if it takes me away, even if this is the end of my life, Allah Azza wa is the one who's guiding my life. So you don't panic. Initially, yes, you can. But you remind yourself of the fact that Allah Azza wa is there. When that's the case, then you're leaning on a something that is dependable. Allah Azza wa Jal. Had zghina. So the Prophet Sallallahu he redefines what it means to be rich. Like in another hadith, when he redefined what it means to be bankrupt. So he said, أَتَعْلَمُونَ مَنِ muflis." He says, do you know who is the muflis? Who is the bankrupt? So they said, O Prophet of Allah is the one who has no possessions and no money. Exactly our answer. He says, no, the bankrupt is the one who comes on the day of judgment with good deeds, but he comes and he had hurt so and so, and backbitten so and so, and uh, harmed, you know, and then talked ill of so and so. And they take from his good deeds one by one, one by one, until it exhausts all of his good deeds and he's bankrupt that's real bankruptcy not in the dunya because in the akhirah because you can make it up in the dunya you're bankrupt now tomorrow you'll work you'll find something else you'll make it up what are you going to do in the akhirah if you go bankrupt who are you going to borrow from no one will give you anything it's done it's done deal so al ghani if you want to be rich Aim for the richness of the soul. And why is it that we clamor and run after the richness of the body, but not the richness of the soul? I want to have more money, more money, and more of it. We say, Tayyib, okay, fine, go get money. But why aren't you paying attention to the fact that you need to be rich on the inside as well, not only on the outside? Cultivate your heart, your soul your manners, your connection to Allah Azza wa Jal, so that you would at least live a balanced life. But not only money, money, and buy, buy, and consume and consume, 
and entertainment, entertainment, and that is it. And that is the outcome of your entire life. That's how you spent it. You need something much and deeper. Because tell you what, when they say money doesn't buy happiness, it is true. It makes your life easier, yes. But you will get money and you will pay the, pay the price for it. If you don't have iman. You'll pay the price with it because you'll be anxious. So you'll develop anxiety. You'll develop depression. You'll develop all sort of mental illnesses. The children, the wife, the husband will be ungrateful. The family will fragment and break. All that with money. So if you think that money on its own is enough, you did not understand what it means to truly be rich. Right? So remember that redefinition of the Prophet ﷺ. It's not about how much you have. It's how much you have on the inside. What it means to be a mu'min on the inside. That's what iman is. The following chapter is Babu Fadli al-Faqri, the virtue of poverty. This is the title that Al-Bukhari gives to the following few ahadith. And it says here that the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with a Sahabi. It is not named in this narration, but it's likely Abu Dhar. But regardless, a sahabi who was sitting next to him. And they're looking at people. And the Prophet ﷺ said to that sahabi, points to a man and he says, Ma fi hadha? What do you think of that person? And he said, Rajulun min ashraf nas, a nobleman. A noble man. Meaning a man of distinct nobility and well known. This is by Allah likeliest that if he proposes to marry a woman that they would give that woman to him. That is what he is, a man of stature. And if he intercedes that his intercession will be accepted. He said the Prophet kept quiet after that answer. Then another man passed by. So the Prophet pointed to him and he says, Ma fi hadha? What do you think about this, this one? He says, Ya Rasulullah, hadha rajulu min muslimin. He says, This is a man of the poor Muslims. In an la yunkah. He is likely as that if he wants to marry, you're not going to be given that woman. And if he intercedes, that his intercession will not be accepted. And if he speaks, no one listens to him. He says, this one, the second one, is better than the earth's fill of the other one. And this hadith is incredible. Is incredible to tell you about People's scale of judgment, but how Allah Azza wa sees people, how you and I see people, right? And how Allah Azza wa sees people, which is complete opposite. Because the first man of the Prophet ﷺ was asking to teach, he was asking to say, How is it that you perceive? Not only you, but all of us. And how is it that Allah sees? Because you need to start seeing things the way that Allah sees things as much as possible. Not the way that we foolishly judge people. And that's not an invitation for you to start, you know, passing judgment on people. No, here you had Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to tell you the reality of things. So we don't know what inside people's hearts. But the Prophet through Allah Azza knows. So the first person... Okay, when he said, a noble man, a noble man means that he comes from a family. He's a chief in his village, a well-known person. Now, I, not, let's not think of the past, think of the present. Of people who are like that, a well-known person, 
a well-known family, has connections, right? has money. If he goes anywhere in the city, people know him. If he wants to get anywhere in the city, he gets in. Right? A noble man. Okay, what else? In khatab an yunkah. As he wants to marry any woman, he's going to get her. Right? Meaning they would love, they would love that he would propose to them. What? Well, it's like, you know how like you would imagine that your daughter would marry a prince? Right? A prince. Oh my God, that's, that's the ultimate she doesn't have to work for the rest of her life. She will have servants. She will have this and that. It's like if he just knocks on the door, what, you want our daughter? Take her. Take her. So that's, a, that's, the, that's the kind of guy that we're talking about. Hariyu and that if he wants that woman, every woman would want to be his wife. And if he intercedes, that his intercession will be accepted. He goes into a people and he says, hire so and so. Yes, you. Yes, of course. For your, for your eyes, of course, we will, he'll be hired. Uh, give so-and-so a loan. Of course, give him a loan, just for you, you know? Is, is it clear in your minds right now? Right? Get, get, he wants to buy this piece of land. Well, we, we usually wouldn't, but for you, we'll give it to him. That type of influence we're talking about. Just to see how attractive it is to have that person around. Okay, so the Prophet didn't say anything, then the next person. So, a poor man among the many poor Muslims. So this person that, if you wanna, he comes and he wants to marry your sister and your daughter, you say what? Well, when it's nice that you came to visit, but um, uh, there's no match. Please, you know, leave. Because you think that... Well, am I going to give my daughter to him? What does he have? So now, he's not going to get his pick of woman. And if he wants to intercede, no one knows him. And no one cares about him. And the last one, which is heartbreaking, which is if, And if he says anything, no one listens to him. He comes to say, I have an idea. Keep it to yourself. We can fix this. No one is interested in how you want to fix things. Can I just help here? No one is interested in your help. Subhanallah. A poor Muslim by himself, weak. So that's when the Prophet ﷺ comes and he says, this unknown fella that no one cares about and no one pays attention under everybody's radar, no one pays attention to him, he's better than the earth's fill of that other person. So, I don't know how many people it takes to fill the earth so that we can make a comparison. I don't know. It's not just this person is better than a hundred people like this person, or a thousand, or a million. Can you imagine the number? One person better than a million people? And we're not talking about non-Muslims. Muslim to Muslim. But one person better than a million people, or two, or five, or ten million? And so on and so on. Which tells you that your judgment could deceive you when it comes to Muslims. Someone who is very famous and very eloquent. And when he speaks, everybody listens to him. And you think, oh, that is it. This is the person to listen to and go to and take, get advice from and solve problems. And you could, be, you could have someone in the corner of the masjid sitting there. No one knows about him. And he's better than everybody in the masjid. Allahu A'lam. That's why we don't pass judgment and we don't look down on other people. But at the same time, understand that stature and status and nobility and lineage and power doesn't mean that you are great in the sight of Allah. It means that you have things in this life. But are you able to use them in ways that are pleasing to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala or have they taken you away from Him? Are they taking you away from Him subhanAllah? Another hadith, and we'll see how many we can read. Um, another hadith, he said, one of the Sahaba, he says, Udna Khababa, he says, we visited Khabab, radiallahu anhu, while he was sick. This is Iyadatul Marid. And we've encountered Khabab, radiallahu anhu, while he was sick in some other hadith, where he said something similar to what he is going to say here. 
He said, هَجَرْنَ مَعَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ نُرِيدُ وَجْهَ اللَّهِ he says, we've migrated with the Prophet wasallam, seeking Allah's face, seeking his pleasure, seeking his approval, his reward. So our reward was with Allah for that act. So he's highlighting the fact that we as a Sahaba, we migrated with the Prophet, and what was our intention? Nothing else but Allah And we can just simply skip over this as if it's just something something simple that can be done. But it isn't. You know, when we migrate today, usually, what do we migrate for? Dunya, right? We don't really migrate for the akhirah. These are people who left the dunya for the sake of the akhirah and left behind the family that they know and the money that they have and the homes that they owned. Everybody, a new land. Everything is unpredictable is, and is new. And they did that for Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is hijrah for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. And he says then, our reward was for that with Allah Azza wa Jal. مَنْ مَضَى وَلَمْ يَأْخُذْ مِنْ أَجْرِهِ So among us are those who have passed away and they did not take anything from their reward. Nothing detracted from their reward. Like in other words also, they didn't see the results of their hijrah. He says, Minhum, Mus'ab ibn Umayr qutila yawma Uhud. Mus'ab ibn Umayr who was killed in the battle of Uhud. Very early on. Meaning that we migrated. But first of all, we migrated. We didn't see the results come in except for the battle of Badr. We didn't see the results come in compared to what have happened later. We didn't see the expansion of Islam. We didn't see all those uh, money flow in back into Medina. We didn't see any of that at that moment. So they migrated and some of us have died early. And that also teaches you something which is what? You may not see the fruit of what your actions. You may have a child and you want to raise them in ways that are pleasing to Allah Azza wa Jal, and you do, but you die while they're still young. You may not see the fruit of your deeds. Or you may plant a seed of good things. And it is going to multiply, but not in your lifetime. Whether you are building a masjid or sponsoring an orphan or uh, sponsoring a student of knowledge or whatever, you, you do it. You put it out there, but you're not going to see its fruit. And you will die before you see its fruit. And that is perfectly fine. And that's perfectly good. Because you're not going to take any of that reward away from you. It will be completed for you. Right? Why? Because you've done it only for Allah Azza wa Jal. So don't do things expecting that I must see the reward of that thing right now or while I'm still alive. So many, we're talking about many of the Sahaba of the Prophet wasallam. they were killed and they did not see the opening of Mecca and the surrender of Quraysh. They didn't see these things, but they didn't have to. And he praises them. He says, قُتِلَ يَوْمَ أُحُدْ وَتَرَكَ نَمِرَهُ And he uh, left uh, a piece of clothing, namira, like a cloak or something, you know, like a blanket you cover yourself with. Namira. Says so when we wanted to shroud him, put him in the kafan, the only thing that he had of a possession is that piece of clothing, that like square piece of clothing that he had. You put it on, you know, like, like a rida. So he said, if we cover his face with it, his leg, his feet would show. If we cover his feet, his head would show. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, he commanded us, he says, cover his head and bring some idkhir, grass, and cover his feet with that. Do you know how little he had? Like of worldly possessions, Mus'ab, how little he had? And he came from a rich family. It's well known that Mus'ab came from a rich family and he lived a luxurious life in Mecca. They knew by the fact that when Mus'ab comes, uh, the perfume of Mus'ab preceded Mus'ab. Right? 
He comes from a rich, good family. He leaves all that behind and lives in hardship. So when he dies, the only thing that he has is a short piece of clothing. If you cover his head, his feet would show. That's the only thing. So he says, Mus'ab is the example of those who died and their reward is filled with, is complete with Allah Azza wa Jal. Then he says, وَمِنَّ مَنْ نَيْنَعَتْ لَهُ ثَمَرَتُهُ فَهُوَ يَهْدِبُهَا And among us are those whom their fruits have ripened and they are harvesting them. I mean, we've seen the results of all of our deeds. The lands were open, we became rich, we had money, we had buildings, and we had food, and we had this, and we had that. That was a consequence of what we did. But there was those who never saw a cent of what they were doing. And that is a praise of those who may do, but get nothing in return in terms of worldly reward. And Khabbab was of the opinion, as we, expre as we expressed before, that if you get rewarded in the dunya for the good things that you do, it does take away from your, your reward in the Akhirah. If you remember, right? Remember we mentioned that. That it, if you get rewarded in the dunya, it does take away from your reward in the Akhirah. Khabbab was of that opinion. Because we said, because it may distract you and take you away from Allah Azza wa Jal. Or Allah may not compensate you for it. Because if you lack something in the dunya and you don't get it, Allah compensates you for it in the Akhirah. But if you get it in the dunya, there'll be no compensation in the Akhirah, right? So the praise of poverty here is not necessarily the idea that everybody needs to be poor, right? So the scholars of Islam, and let's, let's mention this, the scholars of Islam actually debate this point. Is it better to be rich or is it better to be poor? So some say it is better to be rich. By rich, they don't mean any yani, filthy rich. They don't mean living in excess, in luxury. They don't mean that. But is it better to be rich, meaning have money, okay? And live well, but not, not be wasteful. So they say it's better to be rich. They say why? They say because you can do more with it, right? You can give zakah, you can give sadaqah, you can sponsor so much, you can do a lot of good with money. In addition to all the other things, you can still pray and fast and do all of these things, but you can do extra because you have money. So some scholars said that. Other scholars said, no, being poor is better. They say, why? Is because money corrupts. The issue is not that if you have money, you can do more with it. It's typically, if you have money, you're actually doing less. Very few people do more when they have money. So, and it corrupts you, distracts you, pulls you to the dunya. Whereas if you are poor, they say that you have time. You have time for ibadah. You have time to work on yourself. Devote more time to study your own illnesses okay, of envy, of arrogance, and then cleanse yourself of it. Whereas money increases your arrogance and increases your envy and increases every bad ailment of the heart. So, of course, it's better to be poor. And some said the best is the middle. To have enough. Not more and not less. Right? Because they said, this is what the Prophet ﷺ prayed for, for his family. Allahumma ja'al rizqa ali Muhammadin quta. Ya Allah, make the provisions of the al of Muhammad, the family of Muhammad, quta, meaning sufficient for them. Meaning not more and not less. So that you don't spend your time, your day hungry and looking for food. At the same time, you don't have extra to distract you. So just enough. Kafaf, qut. So poverty does not, uh, poverty does not, let's say, harm you, and being rich doesn't harm you. Both, both excesses don't harm you. Wallahu alam. 
And we can say, yani, uh, just to add to that, for some people, it is better for them to have less. And for some people, it is better for them to have more. And Allah Azza wa decides for you. And also, you need to keep track of the fact of what is this money doing to me? So if you find that it is corrupting you, have to stop and ask yourself whether this is worth it or not. And again, having money, having a lot of money doesn't mean that you have to live in luxury. You can have money, but live a humble life, down-to-earth life, right? Uh, refuse excess and luxury, because that's closer to the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The last hadith, insha'Allah, because we're not going to finish the chapter today. The last hadith. Um, or maybe let's see, in fact, if we have questions. You have questions? Because I don't want to go overboard. No questions? Do you think we should stop? Continue? Okay, inshallah. So we, we can do one more hadith. Because that, the following hadith requires a little bit of explanation. So that's why... Wanted to know if you guys had the uh, energy to continue or not. Inshallah. Inshallah khair, inshallah. So the, the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, اطلعت في الجنة فرأيت أكثر أهلها الفقراء واطلعت في النار فرأيت أكثر أهلها النساء He says, I've looked into Jannah and I found that most of its people are the poor. And I looked into hellfire and I found that most of its people are women. So this hadith from the Prophet ﷺ is important. It fits the title of the chapter, Fadlul Faqri, the virtue of poverty. Now, it needs a little, a bit, a little bit of explanation. I looked into heaven and I found that most of its people are the poor. That tells you there that poverty has that uh, quality of pushing people towards Allah Azza wa Jal and being rich does the opposite. Then like be it rich uh, makes you more of a tyrant, rebellious. You would exit from Allah's obedience and self think that you're self-sufficient because you think that you have something and you trust that thing that you have, not Allah Azza wa Jal. And you're willing to disobey Allah and go against Him because what you have is dearer to you than Allah Azza wa Jal. That's money. That is the danger of money. It spoils you. You think that this is what matters, not Allah Azza wa Jal. That's why it is likeliest, not always the case, the likeliest that the rich are those who will suffer more loss of faith. And you look at sort of today, richer country versus poorer country. Where does atheism spread more? Richer countries or poorer countries? Richer countries. Because when you have more and you think science can answer all the questions that you have and your own economic plans can save you, that's it. I don't need a God. I am self-sufficient. That's what money does. It does corrupt you. Emotionally, but also here in your head. Whereas poverty pushes you closer to Allah Azza wa Being sick pushes you closer to Allah because you realize the limit of your power. Jani, I went to this doctor and that doctor and they can't help. Who do you have left? Ya Allah, help me. That's why. Right? I tried this and I tried that. No one can help. Who's left? Someone will tell you. Did you try Allah? Did you ask? Just go try Allah and you begin to pray. So when Prophet ﷺ looks into heaven, he says that most of the people there are the poor. It tells you that, yeah, there's something insidious about having money and not knowing what to do with it. It's the problem is not having money. It's not knowing what to do with money and how it does not corrupt you. That's what is so insidious about the dunya, so corrupting about the dunya. The Prophet ﷺ, he's not talking here about something statistical. Like most of the people of the dunya today are poor or rich. Typically poor, like in history. Most people are the rich or the poor. The poor. Not rich, right? They are mostly poor. 
But so the Prophet ﷺ here is not talking about, well, it's just basically statistics. Since most people in, in, in the world were poor, they will also be poor there. No, he's talking about the fact that most of the people in Jannah are the poor because they are closer to Allah than the rich. And some said, some of the scholars have said that uh, it doesn't mean that the rich are not going to enter, but that the rich are being delayed. That's one explanation with the hadith is that the rich are being delayed entry into Jannah because they're questioned. They're being questioned of why, how, and where. Why did you get this money? How did you get the, that money? Where did you spend it? Whereas the poor don't have to. So they said that's why. And that's one answer that is given to this hadith. But another answer is to say no, they're in proportion the rich will be more so, more likely so to be in hellfire, and the poor more likely so to be in heaven. Not that money will prevent you from entry to heaven, to Jannah, but that it is corrupting, right? And it takes away from your iman. Same thing is true about the second part of that hadith. I looked into hellfire, and I found that most of its people are women. Now, some scholars have said, he said, yes, most of the people in hellfire are women, but they said, and most of the people in heaven are women too. Right? Because the Prophet ﷺ said that when a man enters heaven, he goes into Jannah, he'll have how many wives? Two. Each man who goes into Jannah, he has how many wives? Two. So it means that, are men or women more in heaven? Women. So there are more women in heaven, and so also more women in, in hellfire. So that's one answer to this hadith. But personally, what I think is the problem with that answer, though it is accurate, but the problem with this answer is that this hadith becomes about statistics, meaning numbers. And it's not just simply that the Prophet ﷺ is saying that there are more women in this dunya, so naturally there will be more women in, the, in hellfire. He's not saying that. He's saying no. Like in another hadith, and he was speaking to women directly, he says, يَا مَعْشَرَ النِّسَاءِ تَصَدَّقْنَ فَإِنِّي رَأَيْتُكُنَّ أَكْثَرَ أَهْلِ النَّارِ He says, O oh, woman, donate, give sadaqa, because I've seen you to be most of the people of hellfire. They said, they said, why are we most of the people in hellfire, O Prophet of Allah? It says, you curse a lot, and also you deny the favors of the husband. Like, you've never done this to me, you've never been good to me, etc. You're not being good to them. So, both of these things are sinful. Major sins. So, he said, these are the things that are putting you in hellfire. But since they are major sins, once they are forgiven in hellfire, the woman will enter Jannah, right? But the Prophet ﷺ was telling them that you are the most people in hellfire so that they can do something about it. So it's not just a matter of statistics. It's a thing about, yes, you are the most, but do you want to do something about it or not? Do you want to save yourself from hellfire or not? So there's no sense in deluding this hadith because we're afraid of offending, right? Because some sisters may come, and by the way, if a man uses this hadith in an argument with his wife, it's heinous, it's terrible. Like you're fighting with your wife or with your sister or with your, I don't know. And then you say, well, of course, because you're most of the people of hellfire are women. That's what the Prophet ﷺ has said. Yeah, you're using the Prophet ﷺ as, as ammunition in your argument. That's, that's awful. Because you're going to make that woman hate that hadith. And maybe even hate, God forbid, Islam. Or is, if Islam is telling me I'm going to go to hellfire and all women are going to be mostly in hellfire, what, what type of religion is this? You're going to make her hate Islam when you say this. And that is terrible. You're not allowed to use this hadith that way. Okay? And we can say, I mean, there's one woman who could be better than a hundred and a thousand men. Talking about Muslims. So it's completely unfair. The Prophet ﷺ is saying this not to put down. 
He's reporting a reality. If you have a problem with this, you can't have, don't have a problem with the Prophet. You have a problem with the Creator if you have a problem with this. And Allah did not create women to put them in hellfire. No, He's telling them, save yourself from it. So that is a warning. So how do you save yourself from it? You yeah, no, pray to Allah Azza wa to save you from hellfire. You give sadaqah as the Prophet Sallallahu said. You guard your tongue, you guard your eyes, you watch your behavior. You do what Allah loves and you avoid what he hates. And then you're not going to be in that. You don't have to worry about it. Okay? So this insha'Allah hadith is not problematic and it's not directed against women. It's in fact said to save them. And... I mean, I didn't even want to defend that hadith because I said, listen, if the Prophet ﷺ did not have to defend himself and the Sahaba understood it, and the woman there understood it, why should we bother to defend the Prophet ﷺ or what has been said as if, you know, we're in a position of defense, as if we are weak. No, this is a reality. If you refuse it, that's between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, but that is a hadith right there in Sahih al-Bukhari, very clear like the sun. So what do you want to do with it? Do you want to fight with it? Or you want to fight with the shaitan and save yourself and family from hellfire? What use is it going to be if you fight with this hadith? Is it not going to change it? Is it going to go away? Is reality going to evaporate just because you hate it? Or do you want to submit to Allah Azza wa and say, Ya Allah, I understand that your wisdom is beyond anything that I can conceive of. And I know that you are the most merciful. And you told me about this so that I would not be one of the people in hellfire. Save yourself and your family and accept and submit to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam. And I think inshallah we will stop here and complete this chapter inshallah next week. Uh, just let me know inshallah if you have any question. Yeah, yeah. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Yes, yes, yes. They feel miserable. Right, right. So the, the brother is saying that it's a comment uh, where he says that atheists will say that the reason that the poor are more religious is because they have failed miserably in life. So the only thing that they can have to, that they can hold on to is a belief in a next life, a belief in a God. So because I failed here, the only thing that I have left is here. And and partly, partly that is true. And we don't say that that is a bad thing. That failure in itself is not a bad thing. We learn from our mistakes, right? Don't we say that fail, but that's fine. Just get up and learn from your mistakes and kill on. Failure in itself is not a bad thing. De not being denied the, the pleasures of this life or the success in this life in itself is not a bad thing. Because if it opens up your eye to the reality of this life, then it's a good thing to fail and it's a good thing not to have this life. Because those who have this life, as long as they have it, as long as they have that money and the success and the fame and the power, that thing blinds them. And they don't understand the fact that they will die, understand the fact that they are being corrupt using all these tools that Allah had given to them, they are being corrupt and they are corrupting the world around them. They don't see this. They're excessively selfish, excessively self-centered, and you lose any means possible to achieve their ends. But where do, when do they realize all of these things? When they're close to death or when they start losing them? Then they realize that if, if you take someone who's rich, powerful and he oppresses the poor and the powerless and as long as he's rich he doesn't see any problem with crushing other people but take his power and take his money and let him feel vulm and oppression then he'll tell you what I was wrong to treat people that way loss taught him something 
Without it, he would never learn. And when he learns it, and if he learns it well, he'll never be an oppressor again. So we say yes. Loss teaches you something very valuable about the reality of this life. Sickness teaches you something very valuable about this life. And when you learn it, you'll know that, hey, wait a second, all this is going to end. So even for, go back, circling back to the atheists, um, they have no answer to that question. All of it is going to end. So what is all this for? Why do you work? Why do you, why do you continue to live? If everything is going to end and it's complete darkness when you die, what is the value of anything that you do or say? Sit and logically tell me that. And that's why they can and they're susceptible to depression and anxiety and suicide. Because there's no value in whatever they believe. The only person who has an answer is that poor, oppressed person who comes and tells them, hey, by the way, there is something that you can hold on to. Is that he, the person who is, doesn't have anything, was lucky enough and clever enough to notice Allah Azza wa is there. They haven't noticed him yet. So I don't see that um, as a handicap, as if, well, it's just because they're failure, they're holding on to an illusion, I think that the illusion is what you're going through, is this life is the illusion. These people, the blindfolds have been removed from their eyes. Now they can see reality. If this is nothing, and there has to be meaning, meaning is only with Allah Azza wa in the next life. That's my answer to it. Allah No. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Inshallah, we can, we can do that. We can do that next because next week, inshallah, uh, we don't have as many hadiths in that chapter. So inshallah, I can uh, give you a brief biography of Mus'ab ibn Umayr, inshallah, for next week, inshallah.